maximizing the off season. Cheating on your diet is not going to get you further in these off season phases. And today we're going to find out why. Diet adherence across the off season phase is something that is really important in creating an environment for the athlete that is not only sustainable but adherable. So we often hear talks about flexibility in the off season, which is important to build in. We're going to discuss some of those ways to do that here in a bit. But the big thing is that that flexibility can also be taken too far. More times than not, I see the term off season used as an excuse to get in junk food and food that they want to eat that doesn't necessarily serve your own goals more often than I see people leaning on the being too strict side. So what's the biggest problem we see? The biggest problem is typically these large bolus feedings with meals off plan. They're going out and eating a whole pizza, massive burger with fries, sometimes two burgers, and the fat accumulation from these large influxes of caloric intake, specifically large influxes of high fat alongside processed carbohydrates, leading to fat accumulation at a faster rate than they would with the surplus that they have. What are some of the problems with this? First off, these off-season phases are going to get cut short because the body composition is getting worse at a rate that is not ideal for adding tissue. We look at off-season rates of weight accumulation. Most athletes fall between 0.25 to 0.5% per week. And a lot of times what you'll see with these meals off plan is an athlete will jump up, it'll kind of stick, it'll be much larger than 0.5%, and it's a, a large detriment to the overall body composition moving through the weeks forward. So this is going to be detrimental from a body composition standpoint. Also, someone's responsiveness to food throughout the next few days on the plan, uh, as it will lower sensitivity on the days following. It could also mess with digestion, which leads to less assimilation of nutrients, and then it's going to potentially start to play into recovery capacity because we're not assimilating nutrients in the days following. So when we, we look at this and how to manage this as a coach, there's a couple ways we can, we can do this. The first one would be teaching an athlete how to use an, a calorie counting app, something like Chronometer or Kahunas, to be able to track meals ahead of time, whether that's making something at home that fits into the macros of the meal uh, that they have upcoming a little bit better. They can enjoy that experience with family. That is a big one as well. Making sure your dialogue as a coach is having them hone in on the experience with friends and family and less about the food that they're actually going to eat. And then with that planning ahead metric, looking at the restaurants that they're planning on going to. Most restaurants have caloric intake or some kind of macronutrient breakdown. If you go to their website, you can plan ahead the meal you're going to have adjust your food throughout the day using chronometer, plug that meal into your plan and hit macros and, and caloric intake that is fairly similar to what your meal plan is supposed to be for that day. Now, this does take some preparation. I know some people like the idea of going out to be something that's to let go and not have to think about. But the big thing there is you're not having to prepare it and you're getting to enjoy time with friends and family. And so that should be enough to kind of push that athlete into enjoying that experience and start to get them less attached to the food aspect of eating out. Now, there are other things that lead to diet, diet adherence issues and and also issues with managing body composition. And so we need to look at the base plan sometimes and start to make some adjustments to the base plan in order to allow for that athlete to be able to adhere. The big one here is just going to be food variety. A lot of people are scared to implement a large variety of food just due to the realm of bro science within the uh, bodybuilding sphere of chicken, rice, chicken, rice, chicken, rice. That's certainly not ideal. And for adherence across people that like variety, this is going to be a, a pretty big issue. So when we look at building out a meal plan, typically you at least want three servings of vegetables across the day, two servings of fruits across the day, ideally three. And I try to get a variety of carbohydrate sources and protein sources in there uh, for these athletes so that we can get these meals made in different ways and different recipes, and they can make the food that they eat on the day-to-day -day enjoyable. This should include athletes using seasonings and condiments and, and not worried about salt intake where they should be salting all their meals. 
in order to make their food flavorful, which allows for the adherence to increase and they enjoy their meal plan and lowers that desire to go eat these large bolus meals off plan that do lead to that fat accumulation. Now, some of this can also start to waver due to hunger signaling starting to wane. As body fat goes up, we will see that response to food get a little bit less. But one of the best ways to keep food response going is step counts in cardiovascular activity. Hunger signaling kills all seasons to the point where people aren't hungry anymore and they just can't get their food down. One of the big things that I talk to my clients about with keeping the hunger going is spreading their step count throughout the day. This could be five to 10 minute walks after each meal that they have and making sure that the cardiovascular activity that they're doing is done with high effort. So even if it's just two or three or four sessions across the week, this will help with one, cardiovascular output within training, two, hunger signaling and, and GI motility to allow for them to be able to continue to want their meals. And three, it'll keep body composition in a better place across the entirety of the off season uh, where they will have better health metrics because of the improved body composition and better health metrics because of the heart rate elevations from the cardiovascular activity. So what we should be doing with cardio is trying to get these athletes to what's called a high energy flux. They want a high amount of caloric intake going in with a, a good amount or a decently high amount of activity so that there's a large flux or change and energy coming in and energy coming out. This can be done via step counts and cardiovascular activity and training sessions, but the big honus needs to be on step counts and cardiovascular activity. We have data that shows a comparison of groups across different step counts within these four groups. And the group that had the largest step count, which was around 10,000 steps per day, had the lowest risk of cardiovascular disease in comparison to all the other groups, with the group around 2,000 showing the highest incidence of cardiovascular disease, which is a classic example of how steps can help with not only the health metrics, but it can also help with the body composition as we go along this phase. And the final one is complacency. All seasons for some athletes get really long. And if we don't have a timeline in place and reverse engineer the process from where they are to where their end goal is, even if that end goal show is two or three years out, it can really lead these athletes to not knowing the direction they're headed, driving complacency, driving lack of adherence, which at the end of the day is the whole thing we're talking about when it comes to cheating on diets. The final piece of this is going to be knowing when to end these push phases. The reality is at the very dog end of off seasons, there comes a point where continuing with the surplus adds more body fat than it does lean muscle tissue. And as a result, because of that, it takes the athlete too far away from being able to get back on stage where it actually starts to become detrimental. Now, what are the signs of this? Uh, consistent digestion issues is a, is a big one. Uh, you'll see a lot of bloating, a lot of issues with hunger signaling. You'll see health metrics start to get skewed, so issues with managing heart rate alongside blood pressure, very common ones to see. Also, chronic insulin usage needed to manage blood glucose is a pretty big sign. So when the long-acting insulins like Lantus or Levomir get up in that over 20 IU mark, you're starting to see uh, some issues with that. And this could be just seeing those Lantus and Levomir doses get really high for all season phases. And the final thing is just mental fatigue. By the end of 25, 26 weeks of pushing, a lot of athletes will, will deal with some mental fatigue with how much food is having to go in to keep progressing. And this could be a big sign to start to pull back. Now, the rule of thumb that I try to give is keep your athletes no further than 28 weeks out from a show. So this could be either 28 weeks directly or a four to six week mini cutaway from 28 weeks. But the reason I try not to go with that 28 week mark is it, you start getting athletes with preps that are longer than that. Those preps become more of a grind and, and less beneficial to putting the best physique on stage than if, if we are under that mark. So if we reach this point, what do we do? Uh, the next steps for getting out of this push phase and making sure that this client is able to adhere to the diet and fully get the most out of their next all-season phase would be to start moving them in the direction of either a baseline or a mini cut phase, which is going to require a drop in PDs, a drop in food, an increase in activity potentially, and getting them back to restoring health markers and hunger signaling and response to training and nutrition so that they can continue to respond and have productive all-season phases in the future.